May it please the court, counsel. My name is Joe Happy. I'm from the Davis Brown Law Firm, and I represent uh, the applicants in this case who have been, uh, whose names have been read into the record. We're here to appeal the decision by the Iowa Court of Appeals and the workers and, and downstream to the Workers' Compensation Commissioner on the issue of when is surveillance material to be produced in a workers' compensation case. Uh, I'll refer to our clients, the applicants, as the defense because that clarifies who, they're, who they are in a workers' compensation case. The defense here is aggrieved because it believes that the commissioner uh, improperly used, utilized his uh, discretion in taking up the declaratory order uh, request of the core group, which uh, is the uh, alternate party, and even more importantly, misinterpreted Iowa Code Section 8527, on the, 2. On the second question, which is the one that more interests me, at least speak per personally, are, are we in agreement that uh, the, the, there is no deference owed to the commissioner's interpretation of 8527 because we've said, I think, repeatedly recently that the legislature has not delegated any interpretive authority to the commissioner over Chapter 85. Yes, yes, Justice Mansfield. So we, we can look at blank slate on 8527 and decide, do we agree with the commissioner's interpretation or not? That is, is that the right? defense's position, Your Honor. 8527, as a statute, not just subsection 2, deals with medical issues in workers' compensation. When a party or a counsel for a party in a workers' compensation case is, uh, a question comes up about whether medical care should be provided, he or she goes to 8527. If there's a question about the medical bill, he, go, he or she goes to 8527. Uh, if there's a collection action, 8527 uh, uh, speaks to that. And Iowa Code Section 8527-2, which is before the court here today and was, uh, in, in our opinion, uh, the defense opinion, misinterpreted by the Workers' Compensation Commissioner, it deals with, uh, from our perspective, the production of medical records or the collection of medical records. Why do you say that? Because the statute, just looking at the language of the statute, I'm sorry, I should speak yeah. up. Um, is really rather broad, it seems to me. Um, 8527.2 talks about the release of all information, uh, and any privilege is, is waived, all information related to physical condition or mental condition, all and any. And I, and I do understand from your briefing that you say, well, that just means medical records. It doesn't mean surveillance. So I, you got me that far. Uh, but what I'm not understanding is that when a statute says all information relating to a medical issue uh, and waives all privileges, why it then becomes qualified to include medical records but not a surveillance video. In response to that, Justice Apple, the, the defense would say as far as that statement goes, we would agree. However, uh, 8527 to in waiving all privileges, really all privileges. Any privileges. What it any says. privileges. That's uh, the same thing. Uh, we could take that to its uh, it, it kind of an absurd uh, conclusion, uh, going down all of the privileges in Iowa code right right to the very uh, extreme of the priest penitent and. And we know the court, the uh, the legislature did not intend that kind of Do we think it's intended to say that the work product privilege is not waived? I mean, any privilege, when, when they're writing a workers' comp statute in particular, they'd be very, very attentive to work product issues, I seem to be. Maybe not um, priest <laughs> penitent. Yeah. But when you're writing that statute, you'd be thinking um, certainly physician patient privilege, and you'd be thinking work product privilege, I would think. Um, I'm giving it a, coming at you again. When when any privilege is waived, it seems to me uh, that comfortably includes work product privileges, 
in connection with a workers' comp medical issue? Well, here I would cite you to just very brief references in our own brief, but also more specifically to the dissent in the Court of Appeals decision by Judge McDonald, where he kind of goes through a painstaking analysis of the, the work product doctrine, which we in practice uh, admittedly all refer to as the work product privilege. We, we do, and frankly, the, this court has, has referred to it both ways. It's really not a defined term, but Justice or Judge McDonald goes through an analysis of the distinction between attorney-client privilege over here you know, and other privileges and the work product doctrine in, in using his language. And I'm not going to try to argue my case completely from the dissent, but in looking at that, the only real reference in, in the arguments presented to the commissioner, district court, Iowa Court of Appeals, uh, where, where there was even any reference to the attorney-client privilege was just, frankly, in that kind of passing argument, uh, are we really waiving the attorney-client privilege 27 to? So, well, so that's how I would answer that question. When you look at that statute, um, I think it would get to more than medical records uh, dealing with, say, the employer was keeping tabs on the employee when he or she was at work, like he was having, he or she was having trouble lifting weights. He or she was uh, holding their back during most of the day. He or she appeared spacey during the day. Now those are records that go to the employee's physical and mental condition that I think would get released under here that aren't medical records. So I, I think it has to be broader than that. So you, you want to draw a line at surveillance, I think, but it's clear the statute doesn't do it. Justice Wiggins, uh, the defense would agree with you, may surprise you. We agree with you in this respect. Uh, those observations in the workplace, the, the, the pain, that sort of thing, the holding, that is, does deal with the medical condition, but it's not work product, and, and I, 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 I won't put words in your mouth, but you say, well, that was prepared in anticipation it's of litigation. It's a work product, what some investigator sees someone doing on their front lawn. How is that work product? I mean, maybe if you had some conversations with them about things, but how is just the mere observation of somebody being seen <coughs> lifting something that they say they can or doing things that they, you know, not doing things that they say they can either way, how is that work product? I explain that to There's me. a couple of points on that. In workers' compensation, the veracity and accuracy of the injured worker is very important. He or she is talking to a physician and giving subjective complaints, and in many cases, it's the subjective complaints that really directly bear on the amount of the rating and the amount of the, and the level of restrictions. So that's a, the, the subjective complaints and the veracity of the injured worker are very important. How does the defense test that in a case? In, in certain and how is it the work product, the thoughts of the defendant? If I were to ask you an interrogatory, please tell me everybody who has information regarding this case, and whether it be a work comp or a simple car accident, you would have to say, well, Joe Schmo or Jane Schmo from mm -hmm. Ace Detective Agency has information regarding the physical condition of the client. Because even on any time you claim work product, you have to defy, you have to disclose what the alleged work product is, and then you have your fight over that, whether it truly is work product. I mean, if I asked it in interrogatory, you'd have to disclose that information, wouldn't you? That you have the information, not what's in it, but that you have the information. That's correct, but that's the wisdom of the, the Hoover process, you know, the Hoover where, where uh, the defense was allowed to withhold uh, surveillance materials until after the deposition of the injured worker so that the, the injured worker would go in and be asked questions under oath as opposed to what he or she said to their physician or he or she said to their super supervisor and so that the veracity of the injured worker could be tested. If I have things dealing with the veracity of your position, I don't have to disclose that to you until after their deposition. You know, that your, your doctor has written 27 letters to the editor about how unfair this process is. And there's one in town who does it, and you know who it is, because I've used that when I practice, or all that other stuff. 
you know, I can withhold all that stuff from you when you ask me when I'm going to, you know, if you ask me an interrogatory of what information I have concerning this person. So it's fair it, for both sides. Y Your Honor, it's not gamesmanship, though. It's not gamesmanship. It's work product. And here's, I want to go back to your, your original question, and that is, you know, why is it work product? Why is it different? And that is, f uh, surveillance is not conducted in every workers' compensation case. It's expensive, and it's also dangerous. If you send somebody out to do surveillance and it shows somebody writhing in pain on their, on, their, on their porch, you know, and unable to do something, and that is produced later, you've just funded, you know, the, the, the injured worker's case. So, uh, surveillance is done carefully and usually based on some information that is confidential uh, and, and it's, it's I within. Mean, I mean, I, let me give you my understanding of work product and tell me if I'm wrong. And this is the one I've tried to give my students. If it's created in anticipation of litigation for purposes of the litigation, then it's, then it's work product. And if it's something that's done by you, it's work product. If it's something done by somebody you hire, it's work product. If you decide you're going to use it at the hearing, then it is no longer work product. And you'd have to disclose it. Is that? That is a 100% accurate understanding of what, what we believe work product to be. But until, uh, and of course, this is why some defense attorneys do not actually produce the surveillance materials at any point in time because they decide they're not going to use it. Most, I believe, do. This is the problem with the declaratory order process because we really don't have a record here. If you look at the transcript of, of uh, the informal hearing that was conducted by the commissioner, it's me, t it's myself and, and other t attorneys just talking. There's no written record that I can point you to. But I. The, pro let me, the problem I have with this 8527 and I think we're kind of all talking about it, is all information can't mean all information about the condition because if, if you take that literally and all privileges are waived, then that would mean if the claimant's counsel and the claimant exchange correspondence about their condition, about the claimant's condition, then that has to be produced. You're and under the commissioner's ruling, uh, he, he doesn't really say that all information has to be produced. He just says surveillance has to be produced, but other things can be withheld. So uh, you know, where do we draw the line and, and why? What, what, it, what does all information mean if it doesn't mean all information? Under the definition of work product that, that we just discussed, it would be protected under the rules of civil procedure under Rule uh, 1.503.3. It, it, it's, it's, it's not... Uh, it is work product until such time as it's going to be used at hearing or it's going to be taken into a physician and shown. But if you have the information showing that the guy's malingering or faking, you're going to use it at trial. And why should you be able to wait till after the plaintiff testifies, or the claimant, I guess it is, to use it? That's trial by ambush when you have the information, which is clearly if you know you're going to use it at that deposition, you have an obligation to at least identify it, and then we could have a then we, as a court, could decide the fight between you two as to whether it is truly work product in that time. And according to your definition with Justice Manfield, it's not at that point if you're going to use it. So what you're saying is you want to keep it for trial by ambush, but um, it will become non-work product after I get done slicing and dicing the claimant. Your, your Honor, the defense couldn't agree with that for this reason, and that is this is information that the injured worker has in his or her possession. Were they on the roof, roofing or shingling their, their neighbor's uh, uh, garage while they were on light or uh, on healing period? Were they, were they welding? Lots of information a claimant has in their possession that you get secondary documents. What day did they go to the doctor? What did they do this? I mean, that's sort of absurd to, to say that it's different from any other information in the claimant's possession. Well, to sum up, we, we would ask that the Court of Appeals decision be reversed, that the Workers' Compensation Commissioner uh, uh, be reversed or the case be remanded. Um, uh, certainly, we hold to the position that it is uh, work product that should not be produced prior to the deposition uh, when the defense counsel, in his or her, or her professional opinion, 
uh, believes it should then be used later in the case either by presenting it to a physician or presenting it at the time of the hearing. Well, you've got, can, can, go ahead. Council, council uh, uh, in your briefing, you make the uh, argument that uh, this issue is essential to the integrity of the workers' comp system. And, I, and I'm struggling with that notion, and, and here's why, and then I want you to respond. Um, it, it seems to me that even if the commissioner's order is implemented uh, and, and uh, a request for production is made and, and the, the surveillance information is produced, uh, it, it, it doesn't eliminate uh, a, a, the substantial value of, of the surveillance information because you, you still have the ability to show that information to the physicians who are, are weighing in on the case. You still have the ability to use that information uh, in cross-examining the claimant at the time of the hearing. So it, it, it strikes me that that to a certain extent your, your argument is, is a little bit of a stretch. Uh, and so convince me that, that you know, the implementation of this order just absolutely uh, crushes the value of surveillance. Two reasons, Your Honor. One is, uh, I'll repeat what I said about the testing the veracity of the injured worker because it is so important that he or she tell their doctor the, the truth and testify in their deposition. Uh, you know, truthfully and honestly, but, and most but, do. But, but, but you still have, the surveillance doesn't disappear when it's produced. Uh, you still have the ability to cross-examine the claimant uh, in this fashion. Well, well, Mr. Claimant, uh, you, you say you're, you're having extreme back pain, but this surveillance video shows you for the last three months walking outside with carrying your garbage and mowing your lawn with no indication whatsoever of pain. So you still have the value of that cross-examination. Well, perhaps the larger question is, 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 is my second point, and that is that work pot product of counsel on both sides should always be protected. It's so important. Just as the attorney-client privilege is important to the, to the client in any case, so he or she will share with the attorney the, the weaknesses of their case and the bad things, they need to get that out on the table and they're, they're, they're not having to worry about their attorney sharing that. The work product doctrine is so important to, to preparing these cases and to have uh, the other side, either, either way, rummaging through one's, one side uh, uh, is, is really uh, devastating to the system because this could go the other way. This, this, this same, maybe not on the issue of surveillance, but the interpretation of 8527-2 as it deals with any information, it can go the other way. Say, take an intake form that you give to your, uh, your prospective client to fill out in their own hand. Uh, what are your complaints and when did they come up? Or I don't know what the forms look like really, but, but they, are, they do exist because they've been inadvertently produced over the years and you've seen them. So uh, are, those deal with their, their health is that something that should be produced in every workers' compensation case in Iowa? I, mean, I, I just submit that rhetorically. And finally, before you sit down, one, one last question. Why shouldn't we conclude that in the legislature's choice of the words, all information about the claimant's physical or mental uh, condition um, have, have intended that, that the work product privilege maybe isn't so important in workers' comp and that and that this is intended instead of being the adversarial process that we have in normal civil litigation, that this is to be an informal, less adversarial sort of process to get the, to get the claimant quick remedy and, and back to work. Why, why shouldn't we view the legislature's language in that context? Because, Your Honor, uh, 8527-2 is within that 8527 section that deals with medical treatment, medical bills. It, it deals only with medical bills. And couple that with the actual language of 8527-2 as it relates to what you are releasing. It's releasing information. It's not producing information. 
and we did address this uh, briefly in our in in our uh, 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 final brief. And uh, so, if you would look at that language, and in the interest of time, I'll I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you, you, Council. Ms. Parrish Sams. May it please the court, counsel. Sunlight is said to be the best dis of disinfectants and electric light the most efficient policeman. The issue of whether clandestine surveillance of an injured worker can be hidden or must be turned over was a matter for the legislature who clearly and unambiguously stated that in workers' compensation cases, all parties must release upon request all information to which the employee, employer, or carrier has access concerning the employee's physical or mental condition relative to the claim. So your intake sheet should be released because if they describe to you their mental or physical condition under that rule. Your Honor, the intake sheet would be covered by attorney-client privilege. Why isn't that subject to the statute? Because it says waive any privilege. And Justice Mansfield was exploring it, Justice Wiggins exploring it, I'm exploring it now. Um, it seems unlikely that attorney-client privilege was waived by the statute, although, although maybe not. But I, if attorney-client privilege is not waived, work product is kind of a cousin of attorney-client privilege. Um, uh, doesn't any privilege really not mean any privilege. I mean, otherwise we get to absurd results of your interview with the client. Interview notes get released. Your Honor, I don't believe that in this case the resolution um, of, that was decided upon by the commissioner rises or falls upon the um, waiver of any privilege language. I think that to, to this case rises or falls by looking at the following sentence, um, which says that the information must be made available upon request. That is directly in conflict with Iowa Code set, um, Iowa Rule of Civil Procedure 1.5033, which says that the information should only be made available uh, upon showing of um, substantial need and undue hardship. As this but, court, but if you accept Justice Mansfield's definition of work product, and that's something, there's no work product if you prepare it for trial but intend to use it in trial, and that's not work product, why can't you handle this situation with an interrogatory asking if there's been any surveillance and then requested by a request for production rather than having this, this rule that starts requiring people to give all kinds of stuff that they may never even use at trial? I mean, that, that's the question. And, and you could get in that interrogatory surveillance that they're not going to use at trial, but they'd have to claim work product. and. You'd have to fight that out before the commissioner. Why do you need this all-encompassing order to get the same results you can do with a simple discovery request? Um, the commissioner did say that that information did need to be uh, provided in response to proper interrogatory answers. One of the reasons that this, or request, uh, interrogatories to the defendants, one of the reasons that this was, uh, was um, brought by core group was that we were not even getting that information, which is part of the reason why we started down this road in the first place. But I don't necessarily agree that, that this is work product. Isn't that a sanction problem if they're not answering the interrogatories, not getting a, an order, just running by the whole system and saying, from now on you have to produce it? This is based on the legislature's intent that all information concerning the condition of the claimant relative to the claim must be produced upon request. Isn't the commissioner's own ruling inconsistent with that proposition? I mean, the commissioner says you can withhold attorney work product. Your Honor, what the, the commissioner did was the commissioner implored, even though he didn't cite to it, implored um, Iowa Code Section 4.7 that says when there is a specific provision and a general provision that the specific controls over the general. And in my brief, I do cite the recent uh, case of the interest of AM, which talks about that. Um, the specific privilege waiver with respect to the, those child in need of assistance uh, cases trumped over the more general uh, 
therapist-patient relationship. We're dealing with the same thing here. And in, uh, in Code Section 4.7, it says that the statutes should be reconciled when possible, but if not, the, the specific controls over the general. In this case, as noted by the majority decision by the Iowa Court of Appeals, the commissioner did do that. The commissioner said that these, this uh, substantive factual evidence that might otherwise be considered work product under, uh, under uh, Rule 1.503 sub 3 has to be produced upon request without the showing of substantial need and undue hardship, yet reconciled that with the second part in Iowa case law that says, under no circumstances are the mental impressions, opinions, conclusions, or legal theories of the, the attorney case that The case law that the commissioner cites, it's sort of kind of a snippets that are pulled out of context, it strikes me. I mean, don't you really have two general statutes here? You have 8527, and then you have the rules of civil procedure that apply generally in comp cases, where, which shield work product and shield attorney-client privilege materials and shield other materials. Isn't, isn't that what we have, the battle between two general statutes? Um, section uh, 876 of the Iowa Annotated Code 4.35, which is a rule specifically enacted by the Workers' Compensation Commissioner, specifically says that the rules of civil procedure apply only when they don't conflict with an agency rule or Iowa Code Chapter 85, 85A, 86. And in those specifics, it, and when there is a conflict, it is the code section or the commissioner's rule that applies. And so in this case, we have a conflict between 1.503 sub 3 and this idea of needing to prove substantial need and undue hardship and the plain language of 8527 sub 2, which says all information must be produced upon request. How can the commissioners say some privileges aren't under any privileges under the statute, but some privileges are under any privileges? That doesn't seem uh, consistent. Either any means all or any means none. This isn't like a must and shall argument. Um, first of all, the only issue that was before the commissioner, and if you look at the transcript of the proceedings in front of the commissioner, the core group specifically confined their uh, declaratory order, p uh, petition for a declaratory order to substantive factual surveillance videos, photographs, and reports written by, by PIs. The problem is we have to interpret the statute, and we have to interpret what any privileges mean. And if we say any privileges are selective, I don't know how you do that on a principled way, when the commissioner picks some that he's going to enforce, and, or she, and some that he or she isn't going to enforce. And that doesn't seem the principled way to do this. Again, I don't think that this rises and falls based on the language any privileges. It is that following sentence, the information shall be produced. When you're talking about other privileges, whether it be um, you know, spousal privileges or, or physician-patient privileges, those do not come about through the Iowa Rules of Civil Procedure. The work product privilege comes about through Iowa Rule of Civil Procedure 1.503 sub 3. And that is specifically said not to be applicable when it's in conflict with the agency rules or Chapter 85. So we are not looking at how uh, this would affect other um, privileges that may be alleged that aren't specifically created by the rules of civil procedure. Now, we're supposed to read the statutes and rules together and harmonize them if we can. Does it make sense uh, to root? Uh, read this particular statute to be limited to medical records, medical treatment, because of the provisions around it, dealing with bills and all that. And then privilege it would simply mean um, the patient doctor privilege is waived, as the defendants are arguing. What, why is that wrong? Because if the legislature intended to limit it to medical information or information in the possession of third parties, they would have said so. Rules of statutory construction state that we must look at what the legislature said, not what they might have said or even what they should have said. But we look at it in context, and it's in the, buried in the middle of a, of a number of provisions dealing with medical records, and then it uses the term release rather than produce. Can't we um, just interpret that to mean it's just talking about um, medical records? 
again, since the, just because the language is written broad enough to include medical records and that are in the possession of a physician doesn't mean that it um, doesn't also include uh, videos or surveillance reports in the possession of a third party or investigator or in the possession of the insurance company who has ordered that investigation to begin with. Wouldn't it work both ways then um, if the claimant's attorney had um, third party witness reports about what the claimant was able to do or not do, would those be fair game under this uh, ruling as well? And if not, why not? All information means all information. And I do think that this flows both ways. I think that this would also apply if a, um, if a claimant had a conversation with their boss about their case and had secretly um, tape recorded that conversation. What if you go and interview the claimant's coworkers? Do you have to give that up? That depends on whether that has been um, filtered through my impression and my uh, opinions about what that coworker said in terms of the notes that I have taken um, in response to that, or if I actually tape record it. I believe, and I would think that uh, the Keith versus Bernard case that's been that was um, decided by the Iowa Supreme Court a couple years ago does talk about that, about the um, mental impressions and opinions of of um, an attorney who is filtering what is being written down from an interview. Um, What's the experience in other states on the surveillance? Do you know, the work and first in the workers' comp context. The, one of the, the requests of the commissioner was that we should all take and look and see if there was another, you know, all the parties who are involved in interveners should look to see how other states handled this issue and whether anyone else had a statutory section that was similar to 8527 sub 2. There were no states that had that, um, had a similar handled? section. This was briefed um, extensively on how different states handle that. That is part of the um, appendix in this case, um, specifically how they handle it in workers' compensation cases. But overwhelmingly, cases, uh, uh, courts have decided that this is substantive, factual information. Let me, I mean, I haven't, I didn't notice that in the appendix. So let me just give you some states on my own research, and I agree it's different statutes, sometimes by court precedents, sometimes by rule, but it seems like New Jersey, New York, uh, Florida, Alabama are all states I found without a lot of trouble on Westlaw that follow something similar to what used to be the approach in the, before the Workers' Comp com uh, Compensation Commissioner in, in Iowa, the, prior to the adoption of this rule. I did see that in uh, Missouri, they take the position that surveillance is actually a statement by the claimant, and therefore, since the claimant can go ask for his or her own statement, the claimant can get it. That seems to me kind of an intriguing interpretation, but that's not the rationale the commissioner is relying on here. Am I wrong about that in that summary? It doesn't sound like overwhelmingly they're handling it the way this uh, declaratory rule uh, proposes to handle it. The, the difference is... Um, and I haven't gone back and reviewed all 50 states' handlings of this, but like I said, that the that information, those post-declaratory um, order hearing briefs that were requested by the commissioner that does do a survey of how other states handle this, that is part of um, the appendix in this case. And I'm sorry, I, I, I can't say that off the top of my head. But none of these states had this specific, specific statutory section that says all information concerning the condition of the claimant relative to the claim must be produced. Ms. Parrish um, Sams, does the uh, uh, work product privilege uh, belong to the lawyer or uh, the party? If you look at the language of 1.503 sub 3, it states that both the lawyer and the uh, party has this privilege. Um, um, prepared in anticipation of litigation or for trial by or for another party or by or for that other party's representative, including the party's attorney, consultant, surety, indemnity, insurer. It, it, it seems to me that it would potentially be in the 
um, belong to both. But, but th th the rules you're referring to are rules where the privilege does indeed apply? Is that right? I'm, I'm unclear of your question. Well, I was reading what, from 1.503 sub three. You were referring to what rule there? Uh, the Iowa Rule of Civil Procedure 1.503 sub three. Okay, and the privilege is an applicable doctrine to those rules, correct? Th that work product privilege is created by that specific rule. And again, I think that's in conflict with 8527 sub two. It's especially in conflict with 8527 sub two when you look at the, uh, the legislature's intent in adopting the workers' compensation system in the first place. Well, uh, 8527 two doesn't, it just refers to uh, an employer. It doesn't refer to the attorney, does it? Or a representative? The employee, employee, employer, or insurance carrier. Um, but the, the attorney themselves um, his, is brought in as the representative of the employer and the insurance carrier. They would have no reason or purpose for being there uh, in that case on their behalf. It's important for well, this. I'm, I'm this trying part to decide whether that statute was intended to, to waive the work product privilege. And it, the legislature doesn't seem to be very clear that that's what their intention was. But the legislative purpose um, in enacting the statute was to get rid of um, these technicalities and, and to create a tribunal to do rough, speedy justice that's informal and untechnical, um, which is what the, the work product um, doctrine creates. Well, if they're the also work, to be the construed liberally. The work product doctrine also exists under the, the premise that the lawyers are supposed to be doing their own work in the case and one lawyer shouldn't be doing the work of another lawyer. So how do we apply that component of the doctrine to this statute in your position? Well, perhaps that's where this idea of the enlarged privilege waiver or the, the, the waiver of any, any privilege um, comes in from 8527 sub two. Um, these statutes are to be liberally construed in favor of the employee with any doubt in its construction uh, being resolved in the employee's favor. I, I want to briefly touch on this issue of the veracity because that's, that's um, been brought up throughout the, uh, the arguments in this case. The insurance industry wants to hold on to this information because they claim that this is the only way to test the veracity of the injured worker. This assertion is that injured workers will tailor or shape their testimony if they're given ac access to factual surveillance is simply a polite way of saying that all injured workers are going to lie. These inconsistencies that rise from faded recollection about things that have happened some time ago in the past have become fodder for gotcha litigation in the workers' compensation system. They're taking the position that hiding relevant evidence substantive evidence that helps the agency get to the truth um, is the, the way that this court should interpret this. But if this were the case, why do we have discovery at all? Why not withhold medical records, IMEs, independent medical examinations are requested by attorneys, functional capacity evaluations, causation opinions, even the defendants don't contend or the, the insurance industry doesn't contend that this information can be withheld under 8527 sub 2. Concealing substantive evidence always gives the other side a, an opportunity to impeach or a tactical advantage in, um, in every case. Morrison versus Century Engineering um, gave the, gave, gives the insurance industry unfettered right to go talk to the, the injured workers' doctors without notice to the injured worker even to the extent that they can draft the opinion for their doctor and ask their doctor, ask their doctor to sign it and never tell the worker about it and submit that into evidence. The, the protective nature of the Iowa workers' compensation system for the benefit of the injured worker um, dictates against a reading of 8527 sub 2 that gives those kinds of tactical advantages to the insurance carrier, yet does not give the uh, injured worker 
access to substantive factual surveillance materials. Okay. And I Thank see that you, my counsel. time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal argument? Briefly, Your Honor, I'd make uh, three points or four points here, that, and that is that uh, it's a defense position that the work product uh, uh, doctrine or the work product protection uh, belongs to the attorney that is producing the work. And I'll give an example. If an attorney is taking a statement from a prospective uh, uh, witness and that has to be produced either the, in their notes or even in the, recorded, uh, in the, in the you know, recorded statement if you take it, uh, that's going to, if you have to produce that, you're not going to want to uh, write that down. You're not going to want to record it because your questions oftentimes reveal your thoughts and impressions and your fears. <laughs> and, and, and they really do. Well, how does that compare to just a video of someone mowing the lawn? I mean, I, 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 obviously I get the subjective business of you're asking questions and you're shaping your case. That, but That swings me to number three on my list of points, and that is under the Hoover process, if we want to call it that, the, the process that the commissioner had for a number of years before this deck action was filed, merely delayed production of those surve that surveillance. And that was information that, in that scenario, that injured worker uh, gets together with their attorney before the, their deposition, say, you know, have you been mowing, you know, or, or, or you know, been up on, the, on your neighbor's roof? And, uh, you know, that's all information that is available to the injured worker and his or her attorney, and that is not gotcha litigation. And that was my second point. So my fourth point is, this shows uh, really the lack of wisdom of the uh, Workers' Compensation Commissioner in even accepting this DAC action. This could have been developed through case law with a record for, for your consider later consideration. This could be, be through the legislature and also through rulemaking. And so for that reason, we would ask that the court reverse the uh, Workers' Compensation Commissioner. Well, now that you've raised the, uh, the topic of alternative ways that this could be addressed. I'm gonna um, ask you a couple of questions about that. Um, are you really serious that you think the, the issue that is, is presented here with respect to the meaning of 8527-2 would be, would be better um, elucidated in, in the case brought by a single claimant against a, a single employer? I mean, uh, this case strikes me as, as being so well developed because you have so many interests here who have a keen interest in, in presenting the arguments. Are you serious that this would have been better presented in a single comp case? At least we would have a re record, Your Honor. I feel somewhat uh, uh, embarrassed that we don't have a record to refer to sworn testimony. Instead, like I said, you have our arguments. Uh, but aren't, aren't the point, points mostly legal in nature? Um, I mean, we're, we're, it, it seems to me mostly they are. Um, I, I have to agree with that uh, 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 in that, uh, you know, it's an interpretation of 85-27-2. And, and whether... I mean, whether I'm not sure a record would help us too much, to be honest. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I can envision all kinds of different surveillance, and, and, and I'm more or less familiar with work product, having developed 20 years of it. Um, I'm not 100% sure that that a specific factual context would really illuminate it. Well, certainly, certainly we could we could envision a case where uh, the work product of an attorney, um, you know, held by that attorney only, not by his uh, his or her client or the employer. It could be on either side, a claimant or a, a, a employer insurer on the defense side, um, and, and a and first a deputy and then the commissioner and then the district court all the way to this body uh, would have to determine, okay, sh under 8527-2, this is information that was held only by the attorney and developed by the attorney in, in his or her briefcase and, and the deputy required him to produce it. And let's, let's even take it out of the surveillance. You know, that's the, that's the rummaging through each other's files. And, and, and that's what we're, that's the pole star of the defense argument here today.
But if we're going to um, grant relief based on the your argument that that this should not have been done through a declaratory judgment ruling, uh, what's our standard of review for for that? Isn't it abuse of discretion? It That's is pretty abuse tough. of discretion, and uh, it would it would warrant uh, you know reversal. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you as well, Counsel. The case then is now submitted uh, to the court. Uh, thank you. Bailiff may adjourn court. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.